So uh, good afternoon again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and shalom and kalispera to all of you. And I'd like to uh, ask you, first of all, if you may uh, mute your microphone, it will be easier for all of us because we are, I see, I'm very glad we have such a, a, a big uh, turnout, but we need to be very careful so we can each uh, hear each other. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, on this online event on the occasion of uh, World Poetry Day. Uh, and our event is entitled Poetic Wanderings with Ulysses' Sail. And since most of the event will be conducted in English, I thought it would be nice to open with some welcoming words in Greek and in Hebrew. And I think some will, be, will understand this and some the other. And I promise to move back to English in a couple more uh, minutes. Καλό απόγευμα λοιπόν σε όλους τους καλεσμένους μας από την Ελλάδα και από το Ισραήλ και από άλλα μέρη του κόσμου, ελπίζω. Και καλώς ήρθατε σε αυτή τη διαδικτυακή εκδήλωση με αφορμή την Παγκόσμια ημέρα ποιήσης. Να καλωσορίσω ε, τους αξιότιμους καλεσμένους μας, τον πρέσβη της Ελλάδας στο Ισραήλ, τον κύριο Κυριάκο Λουκάκη και την ε, ε, ηρώ του Ρίμπαβα και τον Πάνο Μητρόπουλο από την Πρεσβεία, με τους οποίους να πω ότι είχα μια εξαιρετική συνεργασία στην προετοιμασία αυτή την εκδήλωση, της εκδήλωσης και τους ευχαριστώ πολύ. Και από το Πανεπιστήμιο Μπαριλάν καλωσορίζω τον αντιπρίτανή μα, τον καθηγητή Άριε Ράιχ, τον κοσμήτωρα της Σχολής Ανθρωπιστικών Επιστημών, τον καθηγητή Αλιέζερ Σλόσμπεργκ, καθώς και τον κοσμήτωρα της Σχολής Εβραϊκών Σπουδών και, τον, και διευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου Σάλτη, τον καθηγητή Σμουέλ Ρεφαέλ. Επίσης, να καλωσορίσω την πρόεδρο του τμήματός μας, την καθηγήτρια Λίσσα Μόρις, τα μέλη του τμήματό μα και του φοιτητέ μα, και να καλωσορίσω κυρίω και όλου εσά. Είναι πραγματικά πολύ μεγάλη μα χαρά ε, που είστε όλοι ε, εδώ μαζί μα απόψε και μα τιμάτε πολύ με την παρουσία σα. Το πρόγραμμά μα, όπω είπα, θα πραγματοποιηθεί ε, στα αγγλικά, αλλά θα αρχίσω και με ένα πολύ, άρχισα λοιπόν με ένα πολύ μικρό χαιρετισμό και στα ελληνικά και στα εβραϊκά, και αμέσω μετά επιστροφή στα αγγλικά. אז ערב טוב לכולם, לכל האורחים והאורחות הנכבדים מישראל, מיוון ואולי גם ממקומות אחרים בעולם, אולי בצ'אט אנחנו נשמע מאיזה מקומות. תודה שאתם מצטרפים אלינו הערב, אני באמת מתרגשת לפתוח את האירוע הזה ואני מאוד שמחה לפתוח את האירוע לכבוד יום השירה העולמי שיוקדש לנדודים הפואטים, לנדודים הפואטים במפרשיו של אודיסאוס. אז נפתח עם המכובדים שלנו, השגריר, שגריר יוון בישראל, מר קיריאקוס לוקקיס, ושאר אנשי השגרירות, שהם לא מדברים עברית, אבל אני רוצה ככה להודות להם אפילו אם הם לא מבינים על שיתוף פעולה מקסים שהיה לנו בהכנת האירוע. וגם שלום לנשות ואנשי אוניברסיטת בר אילן, סגן הרקטור, הפרופסור אריה רייך, והדיקן שלנו, הדיקן למדעי הרוח, פרופסור אליעזר שלוסברג, ופרופסור שמואל רפאל, שהוא הדיקן למדעי היהדות, ומנהל מכון סלטי לחקר הלדינו. אני רוצה גם להגיד ערב טוב לכל אנשי ונשות הסגל של המחלקה שלנו ולסטודנטיות ולסטודנטים שהתגייסו לקראת הערב הזה. ותודה מיוחדת לראשת המחלקה שלנו, ליסה מוריס, באמת על רוח גבית בהמון תמיכה שנתנה לקראת האירוע הזה. וכפי שאמרתי, רובו התנהל באנגלית, אבל בכל זאת מילה ביוונית ומילה בעברית בהתחלה. אז אני אחזור לאנגלית. So going back to English for uh, uh, those, uh, uh, so we can speak uh, all in the same language for at least an hour. Uh, so Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ariadne Constantino, and I teach uh, at the Department of Classical Studies here at Bar Ilan University and at the Salty Institute of the Ladino Studies. The Department of Classical Studies offers courses in ancient Greek and Latin, language, literature, and culture at an undergraduate and a postgraduate level, including a new MA program that we have taught online and in English. We are the only department in Israel to offer a specialization 
in classical reception studies. And we are also in the process of developing our offerings of courses in modern Greek. We are currently scheduling for the next academic year to have three courses at the three different levels of modern Greek. And we are the only academic institution in Israel to offer such a variety in modern Greek alongside the teaching of ancient Greek at all levels as we always do. But without further ado, please let me pass on the microphone to Professor Ari Reich, the Vice Rector of our university. And we are very honored you are joining us for tonight's event. So Professor Reich. Thank you very much, uh, Ariad. Um, so um, I, I'm really very uh, honored to open this. Uh, dear friends and dignitaries, Professor Eliezer Schlossberg, Dean of the Humanities, Professor Shmuel Rafael, Dean of Jewish Studies and Director of the South Institute for the Study of Ladino, His Excellency, Mr. Kriakos Lukakis, the Ambassador of Greece to Israel, uh, Dr. Artemis Karnava of the University of Crete, and to you, uh, uh, Dr. Ariadne Konstantinou of Barilan University, and dear audience for attending us this event from close and from afar. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to deliver my greetings to this special event uh, on the occasion of the World Poetry Day, which is devoted to one of the greatest poets of all times, Homer. Uh, or uh, as uh, some know him as Homerus. Uh, and he was uh, referred to by the great poet Dante Alighieri uh, of the Middle Ages as the king of all poets. Uh, his two great epic poems, the Odyssey and the Iliad, are considered the foundational works of ancient Greek literature. And in this event, we will be hearing recitations from the Odyssey in both ancient and modern Greek and in Hebrew and Ladino. This will be followed by a lecture by Dr. Kanava, after which we will hear modern Greek and Hebrew poetry and music that has been inspired by the Odyssey. Now, I, I find this to be really exciting fusion of, of cultures, a meeting of languages and traditions, namely Greek, ancient and contemporary culture and literature, with, on the other hand, the ancient Hebrew language, the Jewish tradition, and Jewish contemporary culture. I think this is something very significant because the Greek and the Jewish people's great heritage and literature are the two pillars on which all of Western civilization stands. On the one hand, we have Greek philosophy, literature, art, political thought, and on the other hand, the Jewish Bible, monotheism, principles of justice, social compassion, and liberty, which have had a profound impact on modern society as we know it through the Judeo-Christian tradition. These two peoples with their great culture have had a complex relationship over the years, or I should say rather over the millennia, some uh, three millennia. We we've had times of conflict and we've had times of reconciliation. One famous incident of reconciliation and, and mutual respect, which I would like to mention, is a story or perhaps a legend retold in the Talmud about a meeting between uh, Alexander the Great um, and Simon the Just, Shimon Tzadik. Uh, and this meeting, which uh, uh, was occurred in the fourth century when Alexander the Great uh, visited the land of Israel. Uh, at the time, Simon the Just was the spiritual leader and the uh, high priest of the Jewish people. He dressed himself in his priestly garments and went to Antipatris to meet uh, Alexander. Uh, and as soon as Alexander saw him, so does the uh, Talmud tell us, he descended from his uh, char chariot and bowed respectfully uh, before Simon. When Alexander's courtiers criticized this act, he replied, that it had been intentional because he had had a vision in which he had seen the high priest who had predicted his victory before each and every battle. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said, Simon re uh, uh, reflected his uh, respect and honor to uh, the emperor. And, and the second uh, incident of 
uh, attempts of reconciliation, which I would like to mention, is uh, the one made by Maimonides, Rambam, Moses of uh, Maimon in the, sec in the Middle Ages, who attempted to reconcile between uh, Greek philosophy on the one hand and Jewish thought uh, on the other hand, and based his entire um, structure of uh, Jewish philosophy on many uh, Greek uh, foundations. Um, and uh, I think that today maybe we are celebrating another small uh, but meaningful milestone of, uh, of this, uh, 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 such an attempt of uh, cooperation, reconciliation, and joint beautiful uh, event uh, to uh, celebrate uh, the things that are uh, together that we that we have together and that have uh, we we keep uh, uh, cherished uh, all of us. So I wish us all a very uh, successful event. And uh, again, I I commend the organizers for organizing this uh, beautiful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the story of uh, Alexander and Shimon Matzadik uh, keeps returning. Uh, I also spoke about it about a year ago and uh, more recently. So thank you very much. Uh, it is really a, a good story, a good paradigm of reconciliation and mutual uh, understanding and respect. And that is uh, the paradigm we should uh, uh, aspire to. Uh, I will now move on to uh, our uh, our own Dean of Humanities, Professor Eliezer Schlossberg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to see that we have more than 100 participants in this event and it's something very, very nice for the department. Mr. Vice Rector, Professor Ari Reich, the Greek Ambassador in Israel, Dean of the Faculty of Jewish Studies, my colleague, Professor Shmuel Rafael, Head of the Department of Classical Studies, Professor Lisa Morris, distinguished students and participants. I'm very pleased to be here with you, all of us together at the opening of this important event organized by the Department of Classical Studies. Poetry is always an interesting topic to talk about. Poetry is supposed to express one's innermost thoughts, probably more than prose. Poetry is also usually written in a higher tongue than the prose, in a more superior stylistic combination than the novel, novella, or fiction in general. As someone who was priv previously engaged in Hebrew and Arabic poetry of the Middle Ages, I know that poetry is very strict about matter and especially rhyme. Let me remind you that rhyme without matter in the ancient world is not considered poetry, but merely rhymed prose. I asked myself more than once, how can we combine the expression of spontaneous emotions that break out of the poet's heart and the need to express it in fixed and rigid frameworks of words matter and rhyme. But it is not about poetry that I came to speak to you about. Bigger and better experts in this field than me should do it. I'm here to talk to you about cooperation, an issue in which I understand, or at least I think that I understand a little more. Cooperation is always good. It enables the sharing of forces, resources, knowledge, which in most cases yields better results than individual effort. The Department of Classical Studies at bar -Ilan University frequently collaborates with others. Today, we are taking part in an event on World Poetry Day, held in cooperation with the Greek Embassy in Israel and with the University of Crete. This meeting follows similar events held on other occasions, such as the large and distinguished event held in, on International Greek Day in cooperation with universities and representatives of the Greek government. On this occasion, I would also like to point out that the Department of Classical Studies at bar -Ilan University, as uh, Dr. Ariadne has also pointed out, is the only one in Israel which, in addition to classical Greek, 
also teaches modern Greek, which is increasingly, de increasingly demanded by our students. I'm confident and convinced that the cooperation between the Department of Classical Studies and the Faculty of Humanities at bar -Ilan University and the official Greek government and its universities and research institutes will continue in the coming years and will even increase, strengthen and tighten. And now to thanks. Thanks to the Department of Classical Studies and its head, Professor Lisa Morris, for the blessing, activity and collaborations she leads. Special thanks, of course, to Dr. Ariadne Constantino, who worked tirelessly to help this event, which would not have been carried out had it not been for her vigor, initiative and efforts. I wish all of us a helpful and enjoyable event that will serve as another step in the fruitful and ongoing cooperation between the Department of Classical Studies and the Faculty, the Faculty of Humanities at Barilan University and the representatives of Greek language and culture throughout its generations. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Schlossberg, and for the nice uh, uh, Thank you, and uh, for me, I, I, I will now move on uh, uh, to our uh, next distinguished uh, uh, guest, Professor Shmuel uh, Raphael, who is uh, um, uh, the Dean uh, of uh, Jewish Studies and the head of the Salty Institute for Ladino uh, Studies. And let me tell you that Professor Raphael has not only had a vital role in establishing the academic discipline of Ladino Studies in Israel, but he also has uh, Greek roots from Salonika and Corfu, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe that he spoke not only Ladino at home, but even some Greek. So, Professor Shmuel Raphael, Levakasha. Well, thank you very much, Ariadna, for inviting me. His Excellency, the Ambassador of Greece in Israel, Vice Rector Professor Ari Reich, my dear friend, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, colleagues and friends. On behalf of the Faculty of Jewish Studies, it gives me great honor to welcome you to Poetic Wanderings with Ulysses Sale, organized by the Department of Classical Studies at Barlan University and the Greek Embassy in Israel in honor of World Poetry they. It is very easy to fall in love with Greece. If you love traveling and you love poetry, then Greece is the place for you. Even if you are not the type to cross this country on foot, you can always do so in your imagination. You can also sit by the seashore in a local cafe neo and set sail in your imagination with all the heroes of the Iliad and Odyssey. It doesn't take much effort. The aroma of the coffee, the blue of the sea, and the sound of the bazooki will help you to be on your way. Greece gave the world both passion for adventures and the passion for poetry. The mere mention of Ulysses and his Odyssey are enough to remind us how much literature has been inspired by his wanderings. He may, even, he may even have been the inspiration for anyone who dreams of traveling to faraway places to learn more about the world in which we live. The contribution of Greek culture to poetry is also truly marvelous. It would be no mistake to say that Greek poetry could easily claim a place alongside the splendor of biblical poetry. There is no single poetry lover who has not drawn ideas from the Odyssey. Kavafis, for example, has learned us the importance of enjoying the journey as much as reaching the destination. We are all some type of journey, whether physical, or spiritual. Well, I was born here in Israel. 
but my parents were born in Greece. Yes, in Salonika and Corfu. Each of their lives was a story of a journey, and poetry also played a central role in that story, a life story of endless yearning. On the one end, the yearning for Spain, from which their ancestor had been expelled hundreds of years ago, while on the other end, as Jews, they aimed for the land of Israel and the Jewish world. I believed that the yearning for Greece, however, was no less than the other yearnings. Even when they were living far from Greece soil, they were a part of the Greek and the, the, the Greek culture. They lived in the Greek language, in the Greek music and the Greek literature. They were proud of being Greek Jews. Please allow me to bring you some words in a Greek poetry that my father used to sing. This is a very, this is a song of yearning for Greek soil and embodies the whole complex story of the Jewish world in Greece. Permit me to read few lines. Chronia ime makriasu aluplanitika kezo matochomasu elada pandaero to nostalgo ise protimu patrida keyafto ze seksechno ise protimu patrida keyafto se agapo tofonazo ke kafieme ime tesalonikios. Thank you, Ariadna, for inviting me to participate in this special event. Thank you for organizing this wonderful event. I wish many enjoyable journeys in much poetry in the spirit of the best Greek culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Raphael, for these uh, uh, truly touching uh, uh, words and uh, I will take you up on the continuing uh, uh, with the poetry and words of uh, poetry and, uh, uh, continuously. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, the ambassador of Greece, Mr. Kyriakos Lukakis. I'm very honored to present him to you. And our department is extremely happy that uh, we are organizing this uh, event uh, together. And we hope to have more opportunities in the future to strengthen the presence and the impact, I want to say, of Hellenic studies in our academic institution. So, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, dear, dear Vice Rector Professor Reich, uh, dear Dean of Humanities Professor Schlossberg, dear Dean of Jewish Studies and Director of Salty Institute Professor Raphael, uh, dear Professor Carnava, dear audience, dear friends, uh, Good evening and uh, thank you all for attending today's virtual event dedicated to the emblematic work of Homer Odyssey. Um, heartfelt thanks to Barilan University and uh, Dr. Ariadne Kostadinu in particular for making this happen today, March 21st on World Poetry Day. Greece and Israel, of course, are both countries with a rich tradition in poetry. In the 20th century, Greece has been privileged to have two Nobel Prize poetry laureates, Yorgos Seferis and Odysseus Selitis. But uh, throughout the history, Greece has been blessed with so many distinguished poets from the ancient years to the modern era. In their verses, they capture Greece's essence, its fears and hopes, its triumphs and catastrophes, its changing faces through time. The same is true for Hebrew poetry, be it biblical or modern in wartime or peace, Hebrew poetry expresses Israel's soul reflecting Jewish tradition and at the same time feelings of loss and survival, pain and faith, pride and hope. Focusing on Homer's Odyssey, allow me to contribute the perspective of a non-academic. Ανδρα μιένε πεμούσα πολύ τροπον, 
is the beginning of Odyssey, as you know. It translates to something like, uh, tell me news of a man of many ways and turns. And these might be the most known verses of all time in Greece. But they are more than that. They are the initiation to a literary and historical adventure, to a world of mythical creatures in a long journey of return back home. And not just that, they are also a gate to a world of survival, of solitude and longing, of perseverance against adversity, of triumph, of resourcefulness over might. A journey of a man towards and at the same time away from the divine. These and so many other notions transcend Odyssey's 12,110 verses. An epic that is profoundly humbling and humane and for that reason universal and ever modern. And while we do take pride in Homer being a Greek poet, having captured so many of the values ideas and notions that we share as Greeks, every and any citizen of the world can identify with Ulysses at one point or another of this legendary journey of his, irrespective of their origin, their faith or beliefs. For the Jews of world, for instance, the leading Odyssey idea of Nostos, that is the wandering in returning home, is a powerful concept part of Jewish history and identity, but also the survival instinct. The need to stay alive and strong in the face of adversity is all too familiar to the Jewish people and the horror they, and with them, the whole humanity faced in the Second World War. Dear audience, dear friends, Odyssey's themes of solidarity and fight for freedom and dignity and homeland were also the ideas that inspired the Greek War of Independence back in 1821, whose beginning we Greeks and all our friends will be celebrating in March, on March 25th. In that sense, we see today's virtual event dedicated to Odyssey as, al as also part of the celebration of our National Day. In that same sense, we feel that Odyssey reflects the common features of the Greek and the Jewish souls, which along with mutual admiration and respect is the basis of the profound friendship between our peoples. Again, our thanks go to Barilan University and Dr. Ariadne Costadino and to all of you who are with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lukakis, uh, for these uh, words. It means uh, uh, twice as much to me to hear uh, such uh, uh, strong words uh, for poetry uh, tonight uh, uh, by you. Uh, so uh, we will now continue to the next uh, uh, part of uh, our evening. Uh, which, uh, and I will say that uh, the rest of the evening is divided to three parts. So the first part is dedicated to recitations from the Odyssey in several languages. Uh, in the second and main part, uh, Dr. Artemis Carnava from the University of Crete will give us a short talk on connectivity and mobility in the Eastern Mediterranean at the time before Ulysses' travels. And the third and shortest part is devoted to modern Greek and Hebrew music and poetry inspired by the Odyssey. So we first embark on this journey into the world of poetry and Homer's Odyssey by a short video about World Poetry Day. So let me share that video with you. Thank you. 
Let us now move to the poetic world of the Odyssey, asking what is poetry to you? So the Odyssey, as we heard, is one of the first poetical works of the Greek and European traditions. The, the poem recounts the long voyage of Odysseus, or if you prefer his Latin name, Ulysses, till he reaches his home in the island of Ithaca and all the obstacles he must overcome once he arrives there. This traditionally attributed to Homer and dated to the eighth or seventh century BCE, the Odyssey contains more than 12,000 lines in dactylic hexameter, and it is divided into 24 books, each one for each letter of the Greek alphabet. The voyage of Odysseus is long. It takes him about 10 years to travel from Troy to Ithaca. 10 years of wandering on top of 10 years fighting in Troy. The poem somehow recreates this long period by moving backwards and forwards in time, by moving the narrative focus from place to place, and most famously, by, move, by beginning to tell the story, not at the beginning, but in the middle, in medias res. We hear of Odysseus from the very first line of the poem, Andra me and Epe. But we actually first encounter him only in book five at the island of Calypso, while he sits crying at the shore. Odysseus, always the polymichanos, the polytropos, always resourceful and inventive, is now heartbroken and hopeless. From there, the muse will lead us, along with Odysseus, to all sorts of real and imagined places around the Mediterranean. We will hear in tonight's recitations about some of these encounters, the Lotus Eaters, the Cyclops, Circe, and the Sirens. We will have the pleasure of hearing passages recited aloud, not read the text to ourselves, and in a variety of languages. And for those of you interested to see a text, I believe there is a handout with all the passages in the chat, which you are welcome to download, print, or see in your screen. But you can also enjoy just the hearing the words. So Odysseus and the Odyssey go far beyond the borders of the Greek-speaking world. Uh, Mr. Lukaki spoke about this. And become with time synonymous to wandering and homecoming. So some of you may have in mind the poem Ithaca, by Costandinos Kavafis, which Professor Rafael already mentioned, that where the journey itself, not the final arrival, the nostos, is what Kavafis sets before our eyes. Others here may be thinking of the poem Odysseus by the Israeli poet Chaim Guri, where the soldier Odysseus finally returns home only to find out that the people there speak an other Greek. He writes, and life seems to continue back home without anyone recognizing his scar. The examples could be multiplied to other more uh, modern works of epic proportions, such as uh, Ulysses by James Joyce, The Odyssey by Nikos Kazantzakis, or works striving to tell the story absolutely differently, like the Penelopead by Margaret Atwood. So time and again, poetic expression returns to Odysseus and the Odyssey to convey individual and collective feelings. And we shall also touch upon this aspect of reception tonight. I will just tell you that when my students at bar Land first read the Odyssey, what surprises them is how close the poem feels uh, to many of them, even though it is dated to 2,500 years before our time. So the Odyssey is indeed far away from us in so many ways, yet sometimes the act of reading creates the illusion that we too have wandered like Odysseus in search of our own Ithaca. And tonight we appreciate the power of poetry to overcome boundaries and create proximity, familiarity, and the feeling of closeness. So let us begin then from the prologue of the poem, the man, Andra, as we already said, and the muse. And I invite Noam Bar David, who completed a BA in classical studies with us and is now doing graduate studies in archaeology, all of them at Bar Ilan. 
And Noam still finds time, I believe, to read and practice uh, uh, some dactylic uh, uh, examiner. And he will recite the prologue for us in the original and then in the Hebrew translation of Shaul Chernikovsky, which is it in itself a milestone in the history of modern Greek poetry. So, Noam, bevakasha. Thank you, Ariadne. <clears throat> Let's start with the Greek. Andra moi ene pe musa, pe lutropon hos malapola plankten, e pei troies hieron toli ethron e perse, polon dan tropon iden astea, kainun egno, pola dugen pon toi pathen algia on katathumon, arnumenosen te psuken, kainoston e tairon, aludos e tarus e rusato, Iemenosper, autongars feteresin atastali esin olonto. Nepioi, hoi katabus huperionos e elioio estion. Autar hothoisin afeleto nostimon emar. <coughs> Ton amothenge thea tugater dios eipe kai hemen. Now Chernichovsky in Hebrew. כאן היא לימוזה, הגבר זה רב הניסיון, שנדד הרבה מאוד, אחר הורסו את רויה הקריה הקדושה. ראה ערים של רבים בני אדם וחיקר אורחותם, רבי מכאובו צב לנפשו על פני רחבי ימים, בעם לו למלט את נפשו ולהשיב עמיתיו לארצם. אולם את רעב לא הציל, אף כי השתוקק למלטם, יען כי עבדו כולם ברשעם אשר רשעו. פתאים כמותם, שאכלו בקרו של הליוס איפריון אל השמש, ומנע מהם את יום שובם לביתם. שמץ מאלה, הגידי האלה בת זאוס. תודה רבה. Thank you, נועם. Uh, no. That was very nice. And so now we move on to the next passage, the second passage, which is from book 9 of the Odyssey. Odysseus by now has reached the island of the uh, Phaeacians, who will eventually give him a marvelous boat that will take him back home to the shores of Ithaca. But before that, our hero gets a chance to recount to the Phaeacians and to his audience all the wondrous experiences he went through till that point. So books 8 to 12 are part of this flashback narration, and they cover some of the most famous stories of the wanderings of Odysseus. The passage which we will hear now is from Odysseus' encounter with the lotus eaters. Whoever tastes from this lotus forgets the way home. Professor David Chaps, a professor emeritus from our department and known among our fellow classicists as an excellent reader of poetry, will read the passage now in ancient Greek. And while he was un unable to uh, uh, attend this event in person, he, was, uh, 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 he insisted on me telling about the Iliathon, a marathon, so to speak, with a recitation of the whole Iliad that he uh, organized with the Department of Classics uh, a few years ago. And they read the whole Iliad at the central spot at the Barilan campus. So let me now share uh, his uh, video. En then den nema ferumen of voice on emoisi ponton epithoenta. A thar de cathe peven and gaes lot of agon, hoi tanthin on eda edusin. En tha de pe peru be men kayafi sameth vido. Ives are the deep non helon to thoes paraneus in hetairoi. Out are a pe sito yotepas sameth e de potatoes. De tote gon et arus proien peuthes the iontas, hoitines aneres een epithon isiton edontes, andre duo crenas tritaton keru hamopassas. Hoi daips oi homenoi, migen andras iloto fagoisin. Ud ara loto fagoi medon et aroisin olethron he meterois, alas vidosan lotoio passastai. Om dostis lo toi o fagoi mele de akalpon, u katapangelai palin ethelen u denestai, 
al autu bu lonto bet andrasi loto fagoisi loto ne repto meno emenemen nostu telastestai tus menegon apineas agon klaion tosananke neosideni glafuresin hipos duga desa arusas Autartus allus kelomen erieras et aerus sper homenus neon epi bainemen oke au. Me postis lotoi of agon nastoi o lacetai. Oi daips eis bainon kai epi kleisi kathisdon. Hexes des domenoi polien halatipton eret mois. And I'm afraid that Professor Sharps is not here to explain his choice of uh, images uh, to accompany his uh, recitation, but I hope you appreciate his uh, imagination. So we move on now uh, to uh, uh, the island of uh, uh, Cyclops, the Cyclopes. These are solitary giants who live in caves and have no agriculture, no wine, and also no law or assembly. Inside the cave of Polyphemus, Odysseus loses many, many of his men, till he eventually manages to blind the Cyclops and find a cunning escape. But once back on his ship, in a moment of folly, or one should say hubris, Odysseus reveals his real identity. He is no longer Utis, no one, and then the Cyclops can curse him. If Odysseus is to survive, he is to arrive home late, alone, in someone else's ship, and find trouble at home. So we will hear now a passage in Hebrew in the translation of the poet and translator Aaron Shabtai by four of our first year students enrolled in classical studies. Eli Yakover, Aaron Dominic, Nick Kleiner, and David Retti. All four of them are learning uh, ancient Greek this year, and hopefully by next time this uh, uh, by by this time next year they will be reading Homeric poetry in the original in one of our advanced uh, courses. So please, bevakasha ila. Ach kasher itrachaknu bayam kiflay mikodem shov karati ala kiklo. Chaveray misrivi echad echad bemilim shadlot misula akveni. עקשן, למה אתה מבקש להרגיז את הפרא שרק עכשיו הטיל סלע לים, הוא סחף בכוח את הספינה שוב אל החוף, וכמעט אבדנו. לו שמע אחד מאיתנו מוציא מפיו הגה, היה בעוד גוש משונן מנפץ את ראשנו ואת קורות הספינה. הרי להשליך יש לו כוח. כך הם אמרו. אבל על ליבי לא השפיעו. ופעם שנייה קראתי אליו בנפש נזעמת. תקלוט. אם בן תמותה ישאל אותך פעם מה אירע לעיניך ואיך בחרפה התעברת, הגד, שעיוור אותה מחריב הערים אודיסאוס, בנו של ארטס, זה שבעיתו עומד באי תקה. כך אמרתי והוא השמיע גניחה וענה לי, אוי לי אותה נבואה ישנה הנה בה. היה כאן איזה נביא, איש מצוין וגבוה, תלמוס בנו של לאורימוס, שהתייחד כיודע, להתנבא וחי עד זקנה בין הקלופים. מפיו שמעתי שיום אחד כל זה יקרה לי, שאבד את עיני הרועה ביד אודיסאוס, אבל ציפיתי תמיד שגבר נאה וגבוה יבוא לכאן אחד שעוצמה כבירה יצוקה בו. והנה כעת איש קטן, חלש, לא שווה כלום, בא ועיוור את עיני לאחר ששיתקני ביין. אך בוא אודיסאוס, אתן לך מתנות מהריח. ואת פוסידון אשדל שידאג שתשוב ללא פגע לארצך. אני בנו והוא אף מצהיר שאביבו, הוא ירפא אותי אם ירצה. לא יעשה זאת אל מבורך זולתו או איש שחלקו הוא המוות. כך אמר ואני עניתי לו שוב ואמרתי, הלוואי שהייתי יכול לגזול ממך את חייך ואת נשמתך ולשלוח אותך אל בית האדס כדי שלא ירפא את עינך גם מרעיד הארץ. כך אמרתי, והוא שלח את ידיו לשמיים המחוכבים, ופנה בתפילה אל פוסידון. שמע, פוסיידון, שחור השיער, חובק הארץ. אם אני הוא בנך, ואתה הוא אבי, כדבריך, דאג שאודיסאוס ואחרי והרים, בן לאירטס, זה ששוכן באיתקה, לא יחזור עוד הביתה. ואם גוזר הגורל, שיראה את קרוביו, ויגיע אל ביתו, הבנוי ויציב, ואל ארצו שנולד בה, 
שישוב באיחור, אומלל, מיותם מכל חבריו, בספינתו של אחר, וצרות יקדמו הוא בבית. תודה רבה. Thank you very much. Uh, say, please, join me in thanking our first year students. They are very courageous to, to not uh, refuse uh, uh, my request to participate uh, uh, in this event tonight. And from now, from the Cyclops, we will move on and continue our journey to Syrki, or as I like to say, Kirke, in the more Greek uh, version, one of the female encounters of Odysseus. So like others, Kirke too prevents Odysseus from continuing his quest and he, she lures him to, to, to spend time in her bed for a year. But before that, she turns his men into pigs. The god Hermes intervenes and helps Odysseus resist her magic. We will hear a passage with the advice of Hermes to Odysseus and this time in Ladino the language that the Jews carried with them after the expulsion of Spain, and which is still spoken today by some people in Greece and other parts of the world, of course, particularly the city of Salonika, the Saloniki, where I also come from, became for several centuries the home of a Sephardic community that flourished there. A few years ago, Moshe Elion, who was born in Salonika in 1925 and has written and spoken extensively about his experience as a Holocaust survivor, took upon himself the very demanding task of translating the Odyssey and later the Iliad into Ladino. This is an epic translation in so many respects. And I thank very much Moshe Elion, who is here with us uh, tonight too. So I hope you will have the pleasure of hearing your translation uh, I read aloud by Dr. Susie Gross from the Salty Institute for Ladino Studies. But before she begins, please let me tell you that her latest publication is an edition of the novellas of Yuda Chaim Perachia, a Sephardic Jew born in Salonika at the turn of the 20th century, and who survived the Holocaust by hiding in Athens. Perachia worked in the tobacco industry in Eastern Macedonia and Thrace before and after the war. And in between all his other activities, he also wrote in Ladino novels, and poems, and chronicles. So now, Kirki in Ladino. So please, Dr. Susie Gross. Thank you. Ma quando io mi andava por las Santas Vegas, y cerca ya me topava de la casa grande de la fechicera Kirke, entonces Hermes me encontró de la vara de oro, y era como un joven que los primos pelos le crecen sobre su mucho y tiene de la juventud la hermosura. Me apretó él la mano, a mí se adresó y me dijo, Povero, ¿dónde de nuevo te vas, solo, de por los montes, en tierra que no conoces? Cerrados están tus compañeros en mandras estrechas, como los puercos en la casa de Kirke. ¿A liberar los benites aquí? Bien, te digo, tú propio, a atunarte no vas, ma ahí quedarás con los otros. Ma voy a quitarte de mal, que lo sepas, y voy a salvarte. Toma esta hierba potente y vate a la casa de Kirke. Y va la hierba el día de mal al echar de tu teta. Y yo te voy a contar todos los malos colpos de Kirke. Una bebida va ella a prontarte y hierbas en ella va a meter. Ma y en sí no podrá fechizarte por modre que no lo va a permitir la potente droga que darte y todo te despiegaré cuando Kirke a jarvar con su vara luenga te va de tu nalga desvaina tu espada aguda y échate sobre Kirke como si a matarla querías. Ella se va a espantar y rogar que te eches con ella. Tú no refuses de vista la proposición de la diosa para que tus compañeros libere y a ti 
te convide. Mandale orden de dar a los dioses honrados severa jura, que, mue que mueva maldad contra ti, non hará, y a la huerza y a la bravura, tomar no te va cuando estarás desnudo. Esto diciendo, la hierba me dio el matador de Argos, que la arrancó de la tierra y me amostró su natura. Preta era la raíz, mas la flor era como la leche. Molly, los dioses la llaman. Ama, los mortales, con grande pena la arrancan, mas todos los dioses hacerlo lo pueden. Eh, muchas gracias, Anitzhalaginajon. <laughs> Todaraba, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, uh, now we move on to um, the final recitation with a passage about the sirens, those famous uh, females who can enchant sailors and cause their boat to sink. What some students find surprising in this passage when I read it with them is how short and how implicit it is. And yet, in the centuries since Homer, the sirens became almost synonymous to irresistible female temptation. And we are very thankful to the ambassador of Greece in Israel, Mr. Lukakis, for accepting to read the passage in modern Greek. He will read it in the translation of Nikos Kazantzakis and Ioannis Kakridis which I find the perfect combination for a translation of such a poem. Kazantzakis, a poet and an author, and Kakridis, a renowned classical philologist and a specialist on Homer. So, Mr. Ambassador, please. Thank you. When all of you have been here, as the first one was born with the good caravan, το νησί αντικρίσαμε σε λίγο τον Σιρήνο. Με μια ο αγέρας καταλάγιασε και χύθηκε γαλήνη τρογύρα απάνευη και κίνησε κάποιος θεός το κύμα. Τότε πετάχτηκαν οι σύντροφοι και τα πανιά μαϊνάρα και ως στο βαθύ το πλοίο τα πίθωσαν στα τορνευτά κάθισαν ελάτινα κουπιά και γέμιζαν αφρού στο κύμα γύρα. Και εγώ από μια Τρανή και ρόπιτα με κοφτερό μαχαίρι, μικρά κομμάτια κόβω και άρχισα μέσα στα γερά μου χέρια να τα μαλάζω ως που ζεστάθηκαν, καθώς και η δύναμή μου και του ήλιου η πύρα του ουρανόδρομου τα δάμαζε από πάνω. Κι ως όλων των συντρόφων βούλωσα τα αυτιά με τούτο, εκείνοι σφιχτά με δέσαν χεροπόδαρα μέσα στο καράβι ολόρθο, πά στο κατάρτι, και ήταν πάνω του δεμένα τα σκοινιά μου. Μετά, Καθίσαν και τη θάλασσα με τα κουπιά χτυπούσαν. Μα ως τάρμενο το γοργοθάλασσο στη φόρα που είχε πάρει, πια είχε ζυγώσει τόσο που η φωνή να ακούγεται του ανθρώπου, τόδαν αυτές που ερχόταν και άρχισαν να ψιλοτραγουδούν. Έλα κοντά, Οδυσσέα, περίλαμπρε τον αχαιώνη δόξα. Το πλοίο σου στο νησί μας άραξε να ακούσει τη φωνή μας. Κανείς ως τώρα δεν προσπέρασε με μελανό καράβι τη μελοστάλαχτη από τα χείλη μας φωνή πριχού γρυκίσει. Ποιος φράθη πια και ο νους του επλούτηνε, κινάει και φεύγει πάλι. Από βουλή θεών τα πούσιραν οι τρώες και οι αργίτες πάθη στις τρία στον κάμπο, τα κατέχουμε μια άκρη ως άλλη. Ακόμα και όσα στη γη σακέρια γίνονται την πολυθρόφα απάνω. Έτσι μιλούσαν μαϊδονόλαλη φωνή και λαχταρούσε μένα η καρδιά να ακούει και γύρευαν να λύσουν τα σκοινιά μου στους άλλους με τα φρύδια γνέφοντας. Μα αυτοί λαμνοκοπούσαν σκημένοι και πετάχτη ο ευρύλοχος με μιας και ο περιμίδης και με σκοινιά με δέναν πιότερα και πιο γερά με σφίγγαν. Κι ως τέλος το νησί προσπέρασαν οργά και των σιρήνων μηδέ η φωνή στα αυτιά μας έφτανε μηδέ και το τραγούδι η καρδιακή σύντροφή μου έβγαλαν το που τους είχα βάλει καιρή στα αυτιά και πήραν και έλυσαν και μένα από τα δεσμά μου. 
Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ, κυρία Σπρέσβη. Τι όμορφη ανάγνωση. Thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, the ambassador for such a, a, a running uh, recitation. And I think now uh, is time for some music inspired by the Odyssey. And we will hear the song on Avagos, the castaway. The music is by Mikis Todorakis and the lyrics by Kostas Cartelas. It is performed by the actor and singer Christina Maxuri with Kostadinos Evangelidis on the keyboard. They recorded the song and the next one that we will hear later on, especially for this event, and we thank them very much. From, from Athens, they are sending us the following message. Following two years of artistic isolation due to the pandemic and with the war weighing on our souls the last few weeks, we are revitalized to be given the opportunity to communicate again through art. We thank the Department of Classical Studies at Barilan University and the Embassy of Greece in Israel for the invitation. So let me now share the screen with you. Yes. I, I join you all in, <laughs> in uh, 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 thanking. Uh, uh, there is a very sweet uh, uh, voice uh, for the heart. And now I would like to move on to uh, uh, the main part, as I see it over evening, which is a talk by Dr. Uh, Dr. Artemis Carnava from the University of Crete. She's an assistant professor at the Department of History and Archaeology, and her research focuses on archaeology and epigraphy of the Eastern Mediterranean from the third to the first millennium BCE. She has a PhD from the Free University in Brussels in Belgium with a thesis on the Cretan hieroglyphic script of the second millennium BCE. She has conducted research, and I hope I'm saying all the places, in Greece, the UK, Austria, and Germany, and has excavated at various locations in Greece. Her most recent publication is the edition of the Cypriot syllabic inscriptions of the first millennium BCE in the Inscriptiones Grecae project. She also published a while back an article on the Tel Haror uh, inscription from the Negev desert in linear A. And we hope she will have some more to say about such early contacts. The title of her talk is Connectivity and Mobility in the Eastern Mediterranean before Ulysses' travels. So thank you, Artemis. Thank you very much, Ariadne. Let me just share my screen. Have I, have I just a moment. No, you're yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry. Moment. And co host. Okay. Now you should be able to do it. Let me see. Yes. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Can you see it? Yes. Everything works okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So Ariadne, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I would like to thank the host organizations, Barilan University and the Embassy of Greece in Israel for this invitation. Um, I'm um, very humbled to be among you and I wasn't expecting so many people. <laughs> I wasn't expecting so many poetry lovers, but here we are. <laughs> there are all these surprises in life. So I'm also very happy to see, even through a very small window, uh, Panos, <laughs> a collaborator of the Greek Embassy, whom I met back in Berlin, because the mobility is very strong in us Greeks, and we move around a lot, and <laughs> we meet each other in the strangest places, and then we see each other again in the strangest places. <laughs> so this is very exciting. Uh, World Poetry Day today, and uh, what better way, uh, I, I approve as an archaeologist, to celebrate uh, with one of the oldest poems uh, and one of the most important in world literature, I would say. Uh, my role here is rather anti-poetic, I would say. I, would, uh, I thought about trying to detect some reality 
and possibly some facts behind the beautiful words that Omer laid out and all the exciting adventure that he described. Uh, so um, it probably fits me because I think I'm one of the less poetic people around. So my title, Connectivity and Mobility, why did I choose this title? Because I think Omer in his Odyssey, he's all about connectivity and mobility. There's a lot of mobility in there, people moving around constantly trying to get the, somewhere. Uh, they never manage that or they manage that after many, many years. And incidentally, these are two uh, catch words. They're very important notions today in archaeology. Uh, we're very, very much interested in archaeology about these two notions of connectivity and mobility. So um, archaeology, of course, we do have our standard concerns about the ancient world. We would like to investigate uh, a number of issues, but um, we, we're also influenced by what happens in society nowadays as well. We're very much influenced by that. So because our world is very much interconnected and our world is very much mobile, archaeology is very much into investigating connectivity and mobility um, because our world is facing a number of crises such as climate crisis we're very much into investigating environmental issues as well uh, so these are topics that are always pertinent uh, Omer laid them out very beautifully but they're very much of interest to us as well so first I would like to start a little bit by clarifying what is the difference between these two terms and I wrote them down for you connectivity is actually uh, in literature, the various ways in which micro regions cohere. So in other words, what we think of as connectivity is the potential, the possibility of connecting. Whereas, uh, as opposed to mobility, mobility is the actual implementation of contact. The possibility has actually taken place and people move around and they are connected. So these are two different notions and we investigate them very intentively. Connectivity, one can say, is always there. The opportunity is always there. But it's our job as archaeologists to discover when connectivity was taken advantage of. And this does not always happen. So archaeology is the discipline of objects. We study objects and it is through objects that we try to understand how people moved and how people connected through these objects and with these objects in antiquity. And we have, um, um, archaeology um, has little to do with poetry, or maybe the way I do archaeology has little to do with poetry, but I think there's something to be said about Homer's preoccupations, namely long distance campaigns and voyages. So Homer follows Ulysses in his travels. And my question when reading about uh, you know, I thought about what I could present to you uh, uh, in relation to this evening's topic. And I thought I would talk about a little bit about ancient traveling, about the reality of ancient traveling and the problems we face in investigating it. So, um, the, the first, my small introduction is, it starts with a question, when did archaeology become so preoccupied with Homer? When did we start investigating? So curiosity about the past has always been there um, within, uh, in, it's always been there in human nature. But it was the 19th century that um, um, made this quest a bit more systematic because the 19th century started to investigate the past more attentively through the study of ancient texts. So this was aided by the fact that traveling became more easy, as well as fashionable. At first, in the 18th century, it was fashionable and it was easy for the nobility. But then, in the 19th century, we have the rise of a middle class. And this emerging middle class was very much interested in emulating uh, the nobility 
the habits that the nobility had, so they started traveling as well. And traveling became easier and more popular for uh, a number of people in the 19th century. So these travelers coming from Europe towards the east or various exotic places or what the, whatever they thought of as exotic, they saw in their travels ancient relics. And they sought, they tried to connect them with what they knew from the texts that they had already read from the ancient texts. And there was this one man that did this particularly well. He's very well known for, the, for his quest. And this is Heinrich Schliemann, uh, a well-known figure of the 19th century and of our days as well. Uh, Schliemann was, uh, I'm, I mean, there are a lot of biographies, uh, biographies of him circling around. And especially this year, we're going to be hearing a lot about him because we celebrate 200 years from his birth. So for us archaeologists, it's a Schliemann year, so to say. Uh, Schliemann was a self-made man. He's famous for that. He was always very proud of that. He advertised that. And uh, the relatively sort of mature age for his time, um, he was so rich. Um, I, I think he couldn't aspire to being more rich, but he aspired to social recognition. He wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be um to be known and he started uh, spending his wealth in investigating the past it was him who tried to connect the ancient texts and especially homer and whatever homer said with the ancient relics that people saw on their travels in greece and in the east in general so here you see uh, an image of um, schliemann and company in the lion gate a monumental entrance to Mycenae in Greece. Uh, this is a very ancient um, relic, of course, which was always visible. It was, it was uh, a visible landscape. And of course, everybody knew about this and the existence of the Lion Gate and the walls of Mycenae in the Peloponnese in the south of Greece uh, helped uh, the scholars of the time identify the site with ancient Mycenae. So Schliemann, with Homer at hand, he tried to uh, investigate Mycenae. He did the first excavations there. Uh, he tried to find, um, to find objects or the reality of Homer um, in his excavations. He then moved on to um, Mycenae. It was famous because, of course, it was the seat of Agamemnon. And Agamemnon is very well known through Homer because he was the leader of the Greeks who uh, assaulted Troy, who went to um, conquer Troy. And he was always a very special and a prominent figure in, in the Homeric uh, epics. So he started with the, with the top man. He wanted to find the top man. So he started his investigations with Mycenae. He then moved on to Ithaca of course, because he wanted to find Homer's island. He wanted to find Ulysses's island and of course Ulysses's palace because the Odyssey, as we heard today, uh, it takes place, um, the, um, Ulysses tries to get back home and home is a palace in an island in the Ionian Sea. Uh, so, um, finally, after these big places in Greece, he tried to find Troy. Troy itself, that would have been a huge success had he managed to trace the very city that the Greeks assaulted. Um, so he did excavate a site uh, in the uh, west coast of Anatolia and he identified this site with Ilion, the city described by Homer. So um, Hom um, Schliemann was remarkable in the fact that by trying to describe, by trying to find the reality behind these myths, he created his own myth. So he bounded his faith with the fate of the ancient relics. And he became somewhat of a legend himself. So he got some added value, we would say nowadays, from the investigations of these ancient sites. Um, to his, um, um, I, I have to say, um, nowadays, we can even say some positive things about his investigations because all the scholars were very condemning of his methods and his ways in archaeology. Uh, they were considered very, uh, I mean, very poorly 
from the methodological point of view and quite destructive at times. But nowadays, we can also see that through his investigations, he gave credence to archaeology. So um, because he promoted the study of ancient relics as opposed of the study of only ancient texts, because the 19th century believed and our world still believes to a certain extent that texts uh, can tell us many truths and they are in some form superior to what archaeology and ancient relics can tell us. So uh, it is believed that part of the forceful reaction against Schliemann and his investigations and all this effort to combine Homer with some of the ancient relics was due to the academic world refusing to concede that there might be some truth uh, also in archaeological finds and that ancient texts did not give us the whole picture. So where did Ulysses supposedly travel from? and where to. Um, his journey towards Troy, which you can see here with the flash, uh, seems relatively simple. He joined the navy of either of the other Mycenaean kings. They were all related and very well connected, and they all traveled to Troy. So Troy was a city, as described by Homer, which was located on the straits leading from the Aegean Sea to the Black Sea. They stayed there and they besieged Troy for 10 years. And this is the story of the Iliad. Uh, and, but where did his travel back take him is the other question. And this is the story of the Odyssey, Homer's second big poem, which we're mostly occupied here with today. And it's his struggle to get back home. And this became the sole theme of the poem. The whole poem is about a long, endless journey. So it seems like an early specimen of travel literature, if you will. Uh, and this has caused big discussions. So Homer places Ulysses, uh, who tries desperately to get back in the Aegean and the Ionian seas. And modern scholarship has him reaching the Italic Peninsula and even North Africa. Was such a travel possible, I wonder, at the time? And what period are we even talking about? If we can place Ulysses in a historic time frame, that would be the later part of the second millennium BC, or even the early part of the first millennium BC, because this is the time, uh, this is the amalgamation of periods that Homer appears to describe. And it is through the customs and the material culture traits that scholars propose such a date. So the exact circumstances of this problem is described under the title of the Homeric problem, and it's a very lengthy problem to discuss here. But relatively long distance travel was possible even before then, and we know this. We have the archaeological evidence for this. Uh, already, the third millennium is a time that is characterized by what our bibliography calls the international spirit. We call that because a number of social, economic, and technological advances that became current in Mesopotamia seem to spread relatively easy towards the West. Firstly, on the Eastern Mediterranean coast, where some of you are, uh, are now, and then in Anatolia and the Aegean. So more or less, a big part of the old world was interconnected already in the third millennium. Ideas, objects, and people moved, and they transformed connectivity, the potential, as I said, of contact, into mobility, the reality. So connectivity was always there in the old world. The rivers functioned as mediators, as paths for people and the transport of goods. The third millennium also saw the invention of carriages. So goods could travel through the rivers, but also overland. Anatolia is transversed by what has been called the Great Caravan Route, leading from northern Syria over the Konya Plateau to the northern Aegean, the vicinity that is of Homeric Troy. And with my last slide, I would like to, sh to show you what happened to the sea. What about the sea then, once the Great Caravan Route reached the Aegean? The third millennium sees the invention of the so-called longboats, which we see here on a rock carving 
uh, from the Aegean, from the island of Astipalia, a most recent find. We knew these boats existed, but in the last years, we have started to discover most of them because we are looking uh, more attentively on rocks on various Greek islands, and we see the traces of the past there. This is a discovery, many discoveries of the last years that have caused great, great excitement because we have more specific information about what boats looked like already in the third millennium. So these are hardly visible, but they seem to be able to travel long distances already at such an early age. So Ulysses, therefore, in the second millennium, was the heir of a long tradition. The world, the then known world, had been interconnected for millennia, for some centuries, sorry, before his adventure started. We will never know the details of these ancient travels, and for this, we rely on poets to give us a glimpse uh, into people mentalities and feelings. And for this, we all, even as archaeologists, we recognize and celebrate poetry every day, but more specifically on days like these. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Artemis. I'm sure the archaeologists are very excited to see this uh, uh, rock uh, from Astipalia. Um, now we, we will move on to the uh, third and last uh, part of our evening, and it's much shorter than the other ones. We have recitation of three uh, poems in Hebrew and Greek, and then we will finish off with some uh, dessert, uh, some musical dessert, uh, our uh, event. So I will uh, again share my screen for the first one. Um, just a moment. Ένα φεγγάρι ολονυχτή ταξίδευε πάνω στην ασημένια σου χορδή. Ποτάμι σιγανό, ποτάμι. Ήσυχο ήλιο τώρα απλώνεται στη γη. Ζεσταίνει το αίμα σου με φω. Ύστερα θα έρθει το κορίτσι του αλαφρό. Θα κρούσει φωτεινέ παλάμε. Η πέτρα του ύπνου θα κυλήσει από τα μάτια σου. Θα σηκωθεί μέσα στην πρασινόλευκη σιωπή και οι νύμφες θα τρομάξουνε. Θα φύγουν στην κοιλάδα γοργοπόδαρες. Και το κορίτσι το άσπρο θα είναι δροσερό σαν δέντρο κάτω από το φως. Πιο πέρα τα άλλα δέντρα και η σιωπή θα στρίψουν. Θα κοιτάξουν το δέντρο με το φόρεμα της άνοιξη να σκύβει ατάραχο να αγγίζει το ποτάμι, την ασημένια σου χορδή, ποτάμι σιγανό, ποτάμι. Μα εσύ μιλώντας τώρα εμπρός στο βασιλιά και τα άσπρο δέντρου ακούγοντας στα δώματα, μιλώντας με τον τρόπο που μιλούν οι ζωντανοί, θυμήσου. Στη θάλασσα υπνιγμένοι ταξιδεύοντας γυρεύουν την πατρίδα τους. Και όλο κοιτάνε κάτω. So this was a, a video a prepared especially for this event by a, a Vasilis Liveris from the Embassy of Greece, and he read a poem by Takis Sinopoulos, a, a, po a Greek poet belonging to the post-war generation. And in this poem, uh, Sinopoulos is inspired by the encounter of Odysseus and Nausicaa at the banks of the river in the sixth book of the Odyssey. And now I move on to our very own Dr. Chava Bracha Kozakova, who is both a classicist and a poet, and she will read to us her poem in Hebrew, Shirat Yerushalayim. Born in Leningrad, Dr. Korsakova graduated and made Aliyah to Israel just before the USSR fell apart. She has a PhD in papyrology from bar -Ilan University and has published five books of poetry in Hebrew and four in Russian, for which she received several awards, including the Prime Minister Prize for Poetry. And she tells me, and I know, that she's a very proud mother of three and so far a grandmother of two. 
So please, Hava. Kalispera, Shirat Yerushalayim. Tunye kwai si iris, kire nefas, kvem mi hikvem tibi finem dididirint. Horatius, odot, chade chadesre, alna al tishali, dat asur, eize li, eize lach, sof yitnua elim. תלותו של אודיוסאוס באיים דמיון. אחד, את רצונו יסביע. למות לפני השער לא מגיע לא לגיבור ולא למשוררים. עד פה נסחב אחד מהמונים. זה לא נותן לישון. אותי ירגיע רק להשיג, לבלוע, להביע הרמוניות גברים אדמוניים. ואם תקווה עוד חיה בלבנו, כי במהרה נראה בבירתנו כהן גדול ומלך ונביא. הענווה הייתה וגם נשארת טעות, ושפחתכם היטב זוכרת מי לא נכנס בשער, הלוי. We are living through tragic times by the scale of the Greek epics. Glory to Ukraine, to the hero's glory. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move on to the third and last poem for tonight. inspired by the Odyssey by Yanis Ritsos, a Greek poet of the 20th century. A few years ago, Rami Saari, a poet, translation, translator, and a linguist, translated a, a selection of his poem into Hebrew. Ritsos was active in the resistance of World War II and is uh, identified very strongly with the Greek left in, in Greece. The poem, Penelope's Despair, recreates the Homeric meeting between Odysseus and his wife Penelope in book 23, where for a brief moment after their cognition, she hesitates. How should, who should, excuse me, how should she greet a husband who left home 20 years ago? And who is this woman she has become in the meantime? Ritsos returns to this tense scene and it is the feeling of enduring, carteria, and despair, which seemed to trouble him most. The recitation is by the Greek actress and singer, Martha Fringilla, uh, who prepared it especially for us tonight. So let me again share the screen. Yannis Ritsos, the Apognosi of Pinelope. Δεν ήτανε πως δεν τον γνώρισε στο φως της παραστιάς. Δεν ήταν τα κουρέλια του επέτη η μεταμφίεση. Όχι, καθαρά σημάδια. Η ουλή στο γόνατό του, η ρόμη, η πονηριά στο μάτι. Τρομαγμένη, ακουμπώντας τη ράχη της στον τοίχο, μια δικαιολογία ζητούσε, μια προθεσμία ακόμη λίγου χρόνου, να μην απαντήσει, να μην προδοθεί. Γι' αυτόν λοιπόν είχε εξοδέψει είκοσι χρόνια, είκοσι χρόνια αναμονής και ονείρων για τούτον τον άθλιο, τον αιματόβρεχτο ασπρογέννη. Ρίχτηκε άφωνη σε μια καρέκλα, κοίταξε αργά τους σκοτωμένους μνηστήρες στο πάτωμα σαν να κοιτούσε νεκρές τις ίδιες τις επιθυμίες. Και «Καλωσόρισες», του είπε, ακούγοντας ξένη, μακρινή τη φωνή της. Στη γωνιά ο αργαλιός της γέμιζε το ταβάνι με καγκελωτές σκιές και όσα πουλιά είχε η φάνη, με κόκκινες λαμπρές κλωστές σε πράσινα φυλώματα, έφνης τούτη τη νύχτα της επιστροφής, γύρισαν στο σταχτή και μαύρο, χαμοπετώντας στον επίπεδο ουρανό της τελευταίας καρτερίας. So, ancient poetry. modern poetry, archaeology, and music. 
We have just scratched the surface, I think, of the Odyssey and its endless receptions. The wanderings of Odysseus and his homecomings provide ample food for thought. And so the poem has been translated again and again throughout the ages. We heard only a few of these translations tonight. And in each new artistic retelling of the story, new angles resurface. So at the dawn of early Greek poetic creation, the Odyssey and its sister poem, the Iliad, stand as complete works of art. The Odyssey takes us by the hand, scene after scene, and almost in a cinematic fashion, lets our imagination sail with the sail of Odysseus, the sail of Ulysses. Of course, Plato would have something to say about this illusion, this falsehood. But for now, I would like to close this event by thanking again the Embassy of Greece in Israel for our excellent cooperation and especially the ambassador, Mr. Lukakis, for honoring us with his presence. I also want to thank Dr. Artemis Karnava for a wonderful talk, and I hope we will soon find more avenues of connectivity between our academic institutions too. A big thank you to the musicians and to the readers of poetry, ancient and modern alike, in all the languages that you each read. But mostly I want to thank all of you for finding the time and the energy to join us for this online event for the occasion of World Poetry Day. Even in complicated times as this, with a pandemic and a war hovering over our lives, your attendance shows that there is time and place for poetry too, and that there is an important role for the humanities in our societies because or despite what is happening around us. And I invite you to stay with us for one more song inspired by the Odyssey.